recording this session today. I just started it. Make sure I don't forget. Done that time or two before. Mm. Today, um, we are going to be talking about the best practices for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, which are in the family called Solanaceae. And Phil Cox, the um, Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator in Vermilion County, is going to be um, talking with us today on that topic. And I will be the moderator, so feel free to put any questions in the chat as Phil is speaking. Um, if you want to unmute to ask a question, we just ask that you wait until the end or if we give you a break for questions during that time. Uh, so Phil, go ahead and take it away and um, excited to learn uh, some more about tomatoes today. Okay, wonderful. Well, th thank you, Brooke, and uh, thank you all for, that's on the uh, Zoom today for uh, participating during this, uh, this lunch hour. Um, and this is uh, the session three um, of our weekly eight part webinar series. Uh, the first two sessions uh, last week was uh, soils and preparing your garden for planting. And the week before that was uh, starting seeds indoors. So if you missed those, those have been recorded and are on a, a website that uh, uh, Brooke has sent you. Oh, no. I should, admit, I should not able to, oh, there we go. Okay. So this is part, this is our area five ag and natural resources uh, extension educators. And I'm Vermilion County and you've either met or are going to meet over the next few weeks, the rest of the educators in our area five. So this is just a preview of, uh, of what is to come in case you haven't seen it yet for our extension educators. So we're going to start off with uh, tomatoes first. Uh, tomatoes, I think, are by far everyone's favorite uh, fruit or vegetable, whatever you want to call it. It is actually a fruit um, in, in the summer, especially homegrown tomatoes. Uh, you can't beat them. Uh, if you don't plant anything else in your garden, uh, this might, might be it. Um, but Sometimes people get excited and want to plant, uh, get their transplants out in the garden uh, early. Uh, maybe last year you might have got them out a little bit too early. Um, what you want to do is plant after the average last spring frost, which of course, depending on what part of the state you live in, uh, is a little bit different. But um, around here, what I usually like to do, and I'm kind of on the safe side, is to have a Mother's Day be that date. So it's just kind of easy, easy to remember. So I, I don't usually plant till about mid-May and that, that helped last year. We had that late frost last year that um, was in like the first or, or second week, week in May that really uh, did a lot of damage to uh, our, our flowering plants and um, vegetables. But Tomatoes grow best when daytime temperatures average 75 degrees and evening temperatures average 68. Temperatures below 60 degrees or above 80 impair the growth and uh, the fruit set. So has that uh, temperature of about 20 degrees it likes. Um, plant tomatoes at least two feet apart in rows that are three to four feet apart and that will vary a little bit depending on the mature size of your tomato plants, but that's just kind of a rule of thumb there. And of course, you want to determine your staking and your trellis or caging system before you plant that you need to have all those materials ready to go. And what I usually do, I cage my plants because for one, they don't require pruning and they produce more more fruit that way if you use uh, some wire wire cages and uh, stake stake your wire cages so that tomato plant won't uh, make them fall over. Uh, the cage plants, uh, tomatoes do ripen later because there's more shading because you don't have to prune, but then also you have uh, your sun scald is reduced because of the shading. So that is, that is a, a benefit. But as far as uh, fertilizing tomatoes, 
uh, you want to apply your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium according to the soil test recommendations before planting and work them into the soil. I think last week you talked about the soil test um, and how, how to do that and uh, where to do that. Um, I just, I think I wanted to add to that a little bit. Um, if you're in Vermilion County or close to Vermilion County, uh, we do provide a service. Now we, we don't actually come out and take your soil test samples for you, but uh, we do provide bags, uh, uh, sample bags, and we do um, collect them once you take the, the sample and we send them to the University of Kentucky. We have an account for Vermilion County Extension with the University of Kentucky since Purdue University quit uh, testing soils uh, maybe 30 years ago. I don't know exactly when, but uh, University of Kentucky still does. So for about $10 per sample, you can get the, uh, the, soil, the recommendations for your soil nutrients um, and a pH uh, level too. And then for an extra five dollars uh, you can get organic matter uh, sampled the percent of organic matter so that um, that will that includes the shipping we tack we have to tack on a little bit more for shipping so fifteen dollars will get your organic matter too including shipping so if you're interested in that just uh just contact me and we can make arrangements to get you the bags or you can come pick pick them up and uh, and then drop them off if you're close by. Okay, so um, after you've applied your initial uh, fertilizer, uh, if you have a uh, coarse textured soils like uh, sandy soils that won't hold the nutrients for the, the season, um, you want to apply about three quarter to one and a half an ounce of nitrogen per 100 square feet before transplanting the tomatoes and then side dress the remainder in one or more applications after the fruit set. So you can have that nitrogen available for the plant for the whole growing season. Now, I'm, we're digging deeper here. So I'm hoping a, a lot of you have planted tomatoes and eggplants and, and peppers and, uh, and have, ex have a little bit of experience growing them. So we're going to get into some of the things that you might notice once the, the plants start growing. And so first of all, we're going to start talking about infectious diseases. So in Indiana, we have a, sometimes we have experience with a browning and dying of lower leaves. And that's a symptom of both the early blight and septoria leaf spot, a type, another type of blight. Um, so if we have wet springs and wet early summer, that will favor the development of both the early blight and the septoria leaf spot. So the blight and the septoria leaf spot, they overwinter on plant debris left in the ground. So there are some cultural uh, practices that we'll go over that uh, will help with these uh, diseases and uh, fungal spores are splashed onto the foliage by raindrops and splashing water. And a wet leaf surface is required for spores to invade the plant tissue. So it's important that the leaves of your uh, plants are, have adequate time to dry. And so that's why it's important of when you're watering your plants and how you water your plants. We'll talk about that. So here's a couple of photos of early blight and septoria leaf spots. So we got early blight on the, on the left. And you can notice that the, uh, it produces brown spots that are up to a half inch in diameter. So pr pretty large spots that they start off with and they just kind of keep growing and uh, just kind of notice the concentric circles, how, how they continue to grow. So their early blight the spots are bigger than the septoria leaf spot on the right. They just have the small brown spots that are up to eighth inch diameter and they have the uh, tan or gray centers and the dark, the dark black around the edges. 
So another infectious disease, diseases that we have are uh, bacterial speck and bacterial spot. So bacterial speck on tomato leaves, you can see on the, uh, the lower photo, are kind of have the yellow halo around the dark center. Uh, and they're a little bit smaller than the bacterial spot that thus is called speck. And the upper photos are the photos of the uh, bacterial spot. And then also on the fruits of the tomato, uh, severe infections, uh, you can see that they can also have these uh, scabby-like lesions on, on the fruit. So uh, that is something that we do not like to see on our tomatoes. So there are several things that we can do to manage the early blight, septoria leaf spot, and the bacterial speck and spot. First of all, when you go and buy your transplants, if that's what you're doing, if you're not uh, starting your own seeds, you want to select healthy plants. So if the, if the plants, if the leaves, if they look like they already are starting to, you know, yellow or if they have spots on the leaves, you know, those are not plants that you want to buy. And if, uh, if that's all they have in the particular garden center or greenhouse that you're going to, you might want to check out a different different place that might have healthier plants. Um, you want to select resistant plants. So there are a lot of uh, resistant uh, plants, either be, be tomato or, or pepper, um, not so many in the eggplants, but um, I've got uh, some Excel spreadsheets of a uh, resistant plants that I can put on the, the website for you guys uh, later, if you wanna check those out. Also, um, I'm not endorsing this company, but um, I know they have a good website, uh, Johnny Selected Seeds or Johnny Seeds, if you Google that, and you go to their vegetables, you can uh, search for different resistant varieties on different uh, vegetable species, in, including tomatoes, uh, eggplants, and peppers. Now, there are no resistant varieties for septoria leaf spot, at least none that I, I know of, and I have uh, asked our experts if, they, if there's any yet, and none, none yet for septoria leaf spot that, that I know of. Um, one real important thing, and we'll say this uh, several times throughout this presentation, uh, is to rotate your crops. You want to plant your tomatoes and your other your eggplants and your peppers and your potatoes. You want to plant them in different area of your garden. For you want to rotate them at least three or four years, and then. Uh, maybe even five if you want to be on, on the safe side. I, I've seen some recommendations for, for five years rotation. So I know might not have that luxury to have that big of an area. So, but that, if you do, then that's the thing to do. Uh, and then when planting tomatoes, space the plants approximately three feet apart. You want to make sure they can get good airflow through the, through the, uh, the leaves, the foliage of the tomatoes so that they can they can dry rapidly. Um, so re recommend uh, having them upright and not uh, just letting them grow on the ground also. So uh, wire cages is one way that you can do do that. Uh, you can, or you can just simply uh, uh, stake, stake them and uh, tie them to a, to a wooden stake uh, with a, a, piece of, a piece of cloth that have a kind of a figure eight to the stake and to the uh, to the tomato plant, so that you you don't da damage the stem with the stake and have a little bit of protection with that cloth. Um, in early June, if you do not have any kind of mulch down already, um, like a plastic mulch or uh, a weed barrier type uh, woven fabric, uh, you can apply a two to three inch layer of mulch around each tomato plant. Uh, you can use shredded leaves that uh, you might have from uh, the previous year. Uh, you want to make sure that those shredded leaves are not walnut leaves. Uh, you don't want to have tomato plants growing 
within the root zone of a walnut tree um, because that chemical in the in the um, walnut roots uh, juglones will uh, kill tomatoes. Uh, you can use dry grass clippings. Um, you want to make sure that grass clippings have not been treated with a uh, herbicide though. So you know, be careful with that straw. Excellent mulch. Uh, you don't want to. You want to have weed-free straw, uh, and you don't want to mix up and get hay instead of straw. So straw, of course, is the uh, the wheat uh, straw. Um, avoid wetting tomato foliage when watering. Okay, so I know some people might have a sprinkler or, or that overhead irrigation that they use. Uh, if that's the only way you have to water, then do that early in the morning as, as, as soon as you can so that has the whole day and you know the sooner you do it the more chance that it'll be able to dry and won't won't be on there all, all night where it could get uh, get get a disease more easily. Uh, so apply directly to the ground around plants with a soaker hose or slow running hose. Um, you want to get about an inch per week inch to inch and a half. Uh, if you have like a 12 inch square sp space around your plants, um, an inch per week would be about six tenths of a gallon per week if you were just go out there with a, a gallon uh, jug of, uh, empty gallon jug of milk and put water in it. Uh, you could measure it that way. So somewhere between a half to three quarters of a gallon a week if that was, if you didn't have very many plants, just kind of visualize that. Um, apply, and if you have to, as part of integrated pest management, um, you could apply fungicides. Uh, I don't think most homeowners uh, probably don't want to apply fungicides. I know I don't. Uh, it's a lot of work and plus you're getting pe pesticides, uh, fungicides in the environment that you might not really need to, but you can do that. Uh, and if blight does occur, remove and destroy infected leaves as they appear. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and also at the end of the growing season, remove and destroy all infected tomato plants. So there are some non-infectious uh, disorders. I mean, those aren't all the diseases. Uh, uh, there's other references that, um, it covers all the diseases, but those are some of the more common things that, that could happen if you're unfortunate. Um, uh, some, uh, a couple of non-infectious disorders that are, are relatively common are, uh, one is uh, blossom end rot, and this is caused by calcium deficiency in the fruit. So it's just not necessarily a calcium deficiency in the soil, so you can't assume that um, it could be caused by prolonged dry spell or too much rainfall. It's just that the calcium that the fruit needs is not getting to the fruit from, from the soil. And that could be caused by the dry spell. So that's why you want to have regular watering uh, an, in, an inch a week. Uh, and too much nitrogen, nitrogen also promotes blossom end rot and also uh, promotes uh, a lot more foliage than what you would need. So you don't wanna just pour on the nitrogen. So you wanna test your soil to make sure the pH is adequate for tomatoes and that pH range is 6.2 to 6.8. And that, like I said, can be done uh, soil samples and uh, get your soil test results back. And a soil test results say that you need to, uh, to raise your, your pH, uh, you can, you can add additional lime in accordance with the, uh, the uh, recommendations and that will add the cal calcium to raise the pH. Um, you can also mulch around the base of the plants like we mentioned for the, uh, for the infectious diseases, but this will conserve the soil moisture during hot periods and water regularly. So, so mulch um, is, is a very, very good idea for preventing diseases and also preventing um, uh, non-infectious disorders. Uh, another non-infectious disorder is uh, cat facing. 
And as you can see in the picture, recognized by the malformed fruit it, it causes. So it often occurs on the flower buds were exposed to cold. So not much you can really, really do about that. Um, but um, so some of your uh, larger varieties are more prone to cat facing. So your, your beefsteak uh, tomatoes is a variety that has a lot of cat facing. So you can select if you, if that is something that you don't want, you can select the uh, smaller varieties with the smaller fruit. So now we'll go over uh, some five steps for healthy garden tomatoes. So the first step is, of course, like any problem, you need to diagnose the problem. Um, if you have a, an insect problem, you need to diagnose what the insect is. If you have a disease, you have to diagnose what the disease is. So there's a few resources that you can that are available that you can do that with. Uh, one is the Purdue Tomato Doctor app. If you have a, an iPhone, you can go to the Apple App Store. If you have an Android, uh, you can go, go to the Google Play store and those are those cost 99 cents so so that is not not very expensive and they have a lot of uh, great information and a lot of great photos in there that you can uh, use as a resource to figure out what the problem is uh, another thing uh, you could take a sample to your county extension uh, educator um, so just uh, probably want to call ahead of time make sure they're going to be available. Uh, if they're close by, they might even uh, come out to your garden and, and take, a, take a look if they have time in the, the schedule. Um, another thing that you could do, you could send a sample or a photo to the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab. Uh, so that is a, a service offered at the West Lafayette campus, uh, and you could either mail or if you live close to the campus, you could actually uh, deliver it to the lab at uh, the Lilly Hall of Science uh, there on the, uh, the e, uh, be the uh, west side of the Lilly Hall of Science. Um, that is the, it, it does cost though, it costs $11 uh, per, per sample to uh, have that diagnosed. Um, that's for in-state, it costs more for, uh, for out-of-state folks to, to do that. Um, that is the website there. If you just Google uh, Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Lab, uh, that, will, that will come up and it will have the instructions with the form that you have to fill out and also how you can send in the, uh, the uh, photos with your, with your phone. Okay, step two is to plant resistant varieties. Okay, so if you choose varieties that have resistance to the disease, that will go a long way. If you see in the photo, um, the photo that says susceptible, the plant, that has fusarium wilt. So the one on the right is resistant to fusarium wilt. So that will go a long, long way if you get resistant varieties. So, uh, the most common resistant varieties either have a VIM, a V for verticillium wilt, or an F for fusarium wilt, or an N for root knot nematoid resistance. And there are some varieties out there that do have partial resistance to early blight. Like I said, there are no uh, tomato the varieties that have resistance to uh, septoria leaf spot. Okay. Okay, I promised you that we would talk more about rotating uh, crops. So it's good to rotate crops, like I said, every three to four years. Uh, I got this graphic from the University of Minnesota. They've got on there at least every two to three years. So, uh, but we like to say at Purdue every at least three to four years and even uh, five years if, if that is possible. 
So ro rotate between the families. So we're talking about Solanaceae family today, which in the graphic is the tomato family, uh, which has the peppers, eggplant, tomatoes, and the potatoes. And then you have squash family and bean family and onion family. And we'll be talking about most of those except for maybe onions in the coming weeks. So uh, crop rotation is particularly important for you to do for heirloom tomatoes, which I know a lot of people like to plant because of their, their great uh, flavor, but they, they do not have any uh, resistance uh, bred, in, bred into them in their varieties. Okay, let's see. Another cultural practice is to remove tomato plants and weeds as soon as the harvest is complete. So you, you can uh, compost those or destroy them somehow, but if you do compost them, you do not want to use them where you're going to be planting your garden. Um, also fall tillage is a cultural practice that you can do. Uh, there's going to be some remaining uh, residue left over from infected plants. So you want to get that buried four to eight inches into the ground so it'll, it'll decompose a lot quicker. And then uh, another practice you can do is sanitation. You want to clean your stakes or cage, cages each year. You can use household bleach with nine parts water, uh, one, one part of household bleach. Uh, and, and for wooden stakes, you want to soak, soak it in that um, for about 30 minutes to remove uh, any uh, contamination from these diseases, infections. Okay. Step four is to maintain healthy plants. Okay, so we've talked about your soil should be well tilled, should be well drained, and also property, properly fertilized. You wanna have healthy plants. A uh, sick plant is just asking for uh, some kind of disease or insect problem. Uh, pH should be slightly acidic between 6.2 and 6.8. We discussed that. Uh, kind of hesitant to say this, but because uh, I, I recommend soil tests, but uh, in case you don't have time to, to get a soil test or you don't make time uh, to get a soil test, you want to apply two to three pounds of per hundred square foot of complete fertilizer. It has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and you want to follow the label directions for that application for your plants. You want to water regularly. We talked about that. One inch of water per week or maybe an inch and a half is required for full grown plants. And you want to avoid overhead irrigation if at all possible. You do early in the day like we talked about. And add mulch to reduce evaporation and weeds. And you can do that early in the season if you're using black plastic or, or fabric. And the fifth step is if you're using integrated pest management and your use of pesticides is kind of a, a last resort. So if you use fungicides for the control of these diseases or any kind of uh, insect that might, might uh, be an issue with uh, tomatoes, which they usually aren't, uh, but read the label and follow all mixing, applying and safety instructions. Remember the label is the law. And of course, the last several years, we've been uh, preaching that we want to protect pollinators and protect our honeybees and our, our butterflies and our other pollinators and our, our good insects or our beneficial insects. We want to somehow try to protect them also. So there's a good publication called Protecting Pollinators in Fruit and Vegetable Production that Purdue has published along with a series of other protecting pollinator publications. That's a POL-2. And then there's a publication called Protecting Honeybees from Pesticides, uh, E-53-W. Those can both be found if you go to the website and uh, Google the uh, Purdue 
education store. Lots of free publications in there that you can download and read from your computer or you can uh, print if you want to. Um, so just uh, you just type in the uh, search box, either the number or the uh, keywords there. Uh, protecting honeybees from pesticides. It will, it actually has a list of uh, uh, pesticides, including insecticides and fungicides uh, that are extremely harmful to honeybees and other pollinators, and some that are in a list with moderately harmful, and then a list that are not uh, harmful. So that, that is a good resource if you do use pesticides. Uh, if you do use fungicides, do use a, a mix where you mix with a, a water with a fungicide and use a pressure sprayer to get good coverage and get your best results. And products that contain chlorothylonil are uh, preferred. Uh, those are are not as harmful or least toxic to uh, to honeybees and pollinators. Uh, also, copper products are also effective. Uh, and recommended and that will also allow to, you to say at least that you're you're growing organically even though you uh, you can't home gardens can't get uh, certified as as organic uh, and for foot if you do have diseases uh, that you want to prevent then you really need to start applying fungicides before the disease symptom occurs or very early in the in the stages. So even, you know, just a few weeks after you've uh, transplanted. Uh, for more information on using um, fungicides or insecticides and uh, growing vegetables, uh, particularly um, the uh, on pages 77 through 98 are um, it is information in the Midwest Vegetable Production Guide for commercial growers uh, that you might also find some information on in, in those pages 77 to 98 is information about uh, tomatoes, uh, eggplants, and, and peppers and how to use uh, fungicides for those and insecticides and uh, herbicides and which ones to use. And that can also be found on the in the Purdue Education Store. Uh, some other resources besides that are uh, a publication called Five Steps for Healthy Garden Tomatoes uh, by Dan Eagle with the uh, Purdue Botany and Plant Pathology. And he's the uh, an associate pr professor at the uh, Southwest Purdue Agriculture Center um, where uh, Vincennes, the uh, North, north of Vincennes, just uh, a little bit. Um, but he does a lot of research on different uh, vegetables and how to, how to grow them better. Uh, another resource is a publication just called Tomatoes by Rosie Werner. Um, and that, that uh, she is retired now, but she was our Purdue Consumer Horticulture spe Specialist that she retired uh, last year. Uh, both of those publications can be found on the Purdue Ed Store. Uh, website. Uh, one book that I have found that I really like uh, is called Epic Tomatoes, How to Select and Grow the Best Varieties of All Time. And that's by uh, Craig uh, Lee <laughs> Let's see. And he is a tomato advisor for Seed Savers Exchange. So um, I really like that book. So let's talk about uh, Peppers next. Bill, can I interrupt you to ask some questions about tomatoes or do you want to wait until the end? Um, well, I want to wait till the end so we have a uh, make sure we get through this. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, uh, let's see. For peppers, you know, plant at least two weeks after average last spring frost. So they're a little bit more uh, tender than uh, as far as being cold tolerant than uh, tomato plants. If you remember tomato plants said plant after the average last spring frost for 
peppers and eggplant, it's a, at least two weeks, and you could you could even wait longer, of course. Uh, peppers grow best when daytime temperatures between 75, 85, and evening temps average are 65 to 70. Okay, pepper fruit set only occurs at temp temperatures 75 to 86, and night temperatures below 72 will result in a pro poor fruit set. Temperatures greater than 90 degrees or less than 55 will result in a heavy blossom drop. So that will basically uh, wipe, wipe out your, your crop with the, of those uh, blossoms. No fruit be produced. And if you really want to plant a lot of peppers in a, a smaller area, then they can be planted in twin rows 14 inches apart and 40 inches from the center of one double row to the center of the next double row. And peppers do not require support like uh, tomatoes do. So uh, as far as fertilizing, like I said, you need to get uh, your soil test and apply according to the soil test recommendations before planting. Work that into the soil. Uh, use a starter solution, high in nitrogen and phosphorus when setting out transplants and side dress and one or two applications of nitrogen later in the season. And if the foliage starts to turn from dark green to dark pa to pale green or yellow peppers are probably low in nitrogen. So then you'd want to start your, uh, your side dressing for sure. And that's just basically sprinkling um, according to, to the label around the, uh, the root zone of the, uh, the plants. Now we'll get into the infectious uh, diseases, uh, a couple, for, uh, for peppers, uh, anthracnose, that's also a disease of uh, tomatoes. But on peppers, they only occasionally cause uh, lesions on the leaves. So you can't really see any anthracnose on the leaves of uh, peppers, but unless it's under high disease pressure. But the fruits of both pepper and tomato if they're not resistant, are very susceptible, as you can see in this uh, pepper plant here. Not very pretty. I don't think I'd want to eat that. And the fungal spores are splashed onto the foliage by raindrops and splashing water, just like uh, a lot of the diseases that we uh, talked about in tomato plants. Uh, rotate crops at least two years and practice fall tillage in uh, three to four years uh, to be on, be on the safe side. As far as rotation. So management practices also include removal of disease fruits and fungicide applications. So just like in the uh, tomatoes, we want to remove the uh, disease fruits and the, and the plants and, uh, and destroy them. Uh, peppers also have bacterial spot like uh, tomatoes do. And you can see on the leaf there that they have the gray to tan centers with the dark, the black borders, just like in the, the tomato plants. And as far as managing a bacterial spot, uh, some of the, the same, same tips as for tomatoes, but uh, we didn't talk about uh, disease-free seed in tomatoes. So purchase disease free seed and transplants. And then if you have seeds that you don't know if they're disease free or not, you can treat the seeds by soaking them for two minutes in a, the 10% uh, chlorine bleach solution, which we talked about for uh, sanitation and thoroughly rinse seeds and dry them before planting. You can also much mulch plants deeply with thick organic material like newspaper covered with straw or grass clippings. And remember the grass clippings, you don't want to have any herbicide on those. Uh, avoid overhead watering, which we've discussed. Remove and discard badly infected plant parts and all debris at the end of the season. Spray, if you're going to use a fungicide, spray every 10 to 14 days with fixed copper, slow down the spread of infection, and rotation is also very important. 
as we've as we've discussed. Um, and using the black plastic mulch or black uh, fabric uh, prior to planting, that, like I said before, of course, will uh, do a lot for uh, controlling, controlling your weeds and also from having the rain splash uh, the infectious uh, disease onto your new transplants. Okay, the next infectious disease is uh, Phytophthora uh, blight. And that is a, a soil-borne fungal disease that causes wilting of pepper, tomatoes, eggplant, squash, and cucumber also. So that we're getting into the cucurbits with this uh, disease. So if you're going to be rotating, you want to keep that in, in mind for this particular disease that it also infects. Herbits. So it happens on poorly drained soils during uh, warm wet weather and all plant parts may be affected. You can minimize problems with bacterial spot by following these tips. Again, there are resistant varieties that you can select. Uh, remove the badly infected plant parts and all debris at the end of the season. Avoid poor, poorly drained soils and you can also uh, try to kind of um, change your drainage a little bit by planting on ridges or, or beds and irrigate around the base of the plants and rotate crops like we've talked about next year. So egg, egg plants, that's one that um, I wanted to include in, in this group. Uh, I don't think as many people plant egg plants, but I I really like to grow eggplants. Uh, I've grown uh, a lot of uh, eggplants uh, when, when I've had time uh, over the, the years. But like I said, with the peppers, uh, you want to plant at least two weeks after the average last spring frost. Uh, eggplants, they, they like it hot. Um, they grow best when daytime temperatures are between 75, 85, and evening temperatures are 65 to 75. Eggplants can be planted 18 to 24 inches between plants and 30 to 36 inches between the rows. So if, you, if there's a history of uh, Colorado uh, potato beetles or, um, or flea beetles, consider protecting the plants with row cover, covers when you uh, transplant your, uh, your, your eggplants. And also consider using black plastic or black woven fabric to control the weeds and uh, warm the soil. The eggplants really um, thrive in a, in a warm soil. And the good thing about them, they do not require support either. Like potatoes. So again, follow your, uh, your, uh, soil, recommend, your uh, soil nutrient recommendations from your soil test and apply about a quarter of the total nitrogen as a side dress at transplanting. And again, every three weeks for optimum growth. Um, we'll get into some in infectious diseases of eggplant. They really um, are easy to grow and do not really have uh, a lot of problems with diseases. But uh, like in the pepper plant, we have this uh, blight that can affect uh, stems, the uh, leaves, and the fruit, and problem in the wet and poorly drained soils again. So you wanna have healthy, healthy plants and healthy soils that are, are well drained. Um, and then there's several other uh, potential diseases are the uh, Phomopsis uh, blight. It also has early blight and verticillium wilt uh, to bet tobacco mosaic virus and tomato spotted wilt. And uh, disease management, just what we've talked about before is the uh, crop rotation, uh, sanitation, planting and raised beds and the use of protectant fungicides. Um, also uh, get uh, resistant varieties, but there are not very many resistant varieties for uh, diseases or eggplant except for tobacco mosaic virus. So the main thing you have to worry about is uh, 
insect damage for uh, for eggplants, where where they will eat eat the leaves of your uh, eggplant. So this is a Colorado potato beetle. I've never had any uh, any problems really with uh, them, but this is the larvae. Uh, the top photo, uh, bright pink to red with black heads, and then this is a, a later instar that has two rows of black dots on the sides of the body. And then the adult is an adult beetle that is about a quarter to a third of an inch long with 10 black stripes on the wing covers. So that's what they look like. And then the potato foot beetle is much smaller, hence the name uh, flea uh, beetle, but it is a beetle. It's black and about a 16th of inch long and they will make real tiny holes and you probably really can't see them in that uh, lower photo, the hole, well, you can see the hole next to the beetle in the top photo, but you get enough of those and it, it could cause a, a problem with uh, the, the growth of your um, eggplant. But they do attack potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, but they're more prolific, I think, on, uh, on eggplants. So like I mentioned before, if you're growing eggplants, and I have actually not um, done, done this with the, uh, with the row covers, but uh, you can uh, buy these row covers and put them over your eggplants after you transplant them. And then when they get tall enough, you can, they get to the top of the cover, you can remove them. Um, or if you have enough cover and you kind of, it can kind of, it'll push up the, the cover uh, if you kind of tuck it in the, in the soil, the excess part of the cover in the soil. Uh, but you definitely want to uh, remove it once they start to, uh, to flower so that you can get some more pollination. They don't require, um, Insect pollination, they, they do have uh, wind pollination, but they, uh, they do benefit from more insect poll pollination. Uh, as far as insecticides, I'm not gonna cover, cover that uh, today, but there is a publication that uh, Purdue Department of Entomology has published that is real good that um, has managing insects for all types of vegetables in the garden and what you can use. So that is uh, E-21-W, managing insects in the uh, home vegetable garden. And that can also be found on the Purdue Ed Store uh, website. Um, one of the last things I kind of wanted to mention is about Purdue Extension Food Link because I know a lot of people maybe don't buy eggplants and I had that experience when I was uh, selling them at uh, farmer's markets. So well, I didn't really have any trouble selling them most of the time I sold out, but uh, some people really didn't know what to do with eggplant. And some people, you know, don't know what to do with, you know, asparagus or, or Brussels sprouts or maybe some other kind of vegetable they might see in a, a farmer's market or might see in a grocery store. How, how to prepare, how to cook, all the different ways that you might be able to uh, to cook or, or different recipes that you might be able to use. So it doesn't do much good to uh, to grow grow food or or try to sell it if, uh, if people aren't gonna buy it or, or eat it or if you're not gonna eat it. Of course, if you're like me, you only grow what you like to eat. But uh, this food link, there's a, it has a QR code um, that a lot of grocery stores and, and markets are using in front of the uh, the produce that they're selling, um, and they can just you can just scan with your smartphone and it, it'll come up the different ways that you can prepare that food and different recipes. Or you can also um, go to this uh, the website if you just Google. Uh, Purdue Food Link, that will um, get you to this website. And there's lots of ways, uh, shows lots of ways to prepare different uh, vegetables uh, like uh, eggplant and just about any kind of vegetable or, or fruit that you could uh, think of. 
uh, and there's v videos on there also. So just a, a real good resource to uh, to eat healthy and prepare prepare food. And with that, I just wanted to uh, remind everyone that uh, next week um, we will continue with this series and it will be uh, April 6th at the same noon hour with best practices for broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage. So Brooke, did you say there were some uh, questions? Yes. Um, so let me scroll up here in the chat. Um, so the first one was about leaf blight. Um, does using a ground covering like leaves or compost um, help prevent that leaf blight? Yes, yes. If you co cover the ground with a, a, a mulch or a fabric or a plastic, it's just any, anything that you could use as a mulch would help prevent that, yes. Okay, um, and then the next one is, how long does it usually take to get the soil test results back from University of Kentucky? Oh, okay, yeah. Well, depending on when we get into their, their cycle, I mean, it could be as a quick, uh, you know, with our mail service, you know, that's one of the issues. Luckily, they don't have to mail back uh, the test results. They just email those back to me. So, so that makes it quicker. But so we're, we're talking maybe three or four days to actually for it to get to Kentucky. And then they sample it um, three or four days. So I, we've had experience where it's usually about a week or two. Yeah. Probably a couple of weeks, I, I would say. Yeah, is a normal. Yeah. Um, and then just to confirm, I think you already said this, but resistant plants, those um, are, you have to, would have to buy a hybrid and not an heirloom variety to get plants that are resistant to disease. Yes, that is, that is correct. Uh, con confirm. Okay. Um, the, if we put down fabric for the garden, do you, uh, you recommend to remove that at the end of the season? Yeah, because uh, you want to uh, till till the the soil normally. Okay. Um, I tried to get most of your uh, publications in the chat too as we went. So. Oh. Um, thank if you. People want those; they can get them. Um, we we can put those on the website too, right? Yes. Yes. The links, or somehow I'll. I'll get those to you. Yeah, I'll or, have the chat, so I'll have a um, list of them now. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so last summer, my tomatoes cracked. It wasn't like the cat facing you showed just slit. So what would cause that? I think I know what she's talking about. The like mm. cracks. Mine's usually at the top of the tomato. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure on on what. I mean, there's several things that I'd probably have to take take a look at a picture. Um, I think if it's what I think when I worked at Swapack with Dan Eagle, I think some of those were caused by like inconsistencies in watering. So if I, w I was think I was thinking usually a problem. So. Oh, you're cutting up a little bit. Hope it's showing red. You might have to turn your video off. Oh, there you're back. You're cutting out. Oh, there for I, a second. I was going to show. I, I've got this uh, neat uh, eggplant uh, cookbook with recipes that I used to sell when I when I sold eggplants. <laughs> Yeah, you're cutting out again, Phil. I didn't catch those last few sentences, Phil. I think you're cutting out. Yeah, 
Um, you're like, you sound robot because of the internet connection, I think. Uh, yeah, it says my internet connection is unstable. Maybe turn off your video and keep your mic open and that might help. Oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, there you sound, okay. Um, so we'll double check on the, the cracking um, and then get back with you guys uh, next week or in the email about what we, to confirm that. Um, the next question is, I recently heard it's not best to till my home garden in the fall and then plant in the spring without tilling, like tilling again, I guess. Your advice seems to differ. Please help me know what is best. So what kind of tillage schedule would you recommend, Phil? Do you, do you till both in the fall and in the spring or? Yeah, that's, that's what I'd recommend to till in the fall and, and the spring for, for the home garden for these uh, plants that we've been, been talking about. Yeah. Because especially, I mean, if you're having issues or with this, with these kind of uh, diseases, if, if you're not, then the tillage is not a, as important. Okay. Um, the next question is, I have a raised garden. It's about 10 inches high. In the past, the pepper plants, the is it the peppers or the pepper plants, Stuart? Can you confirm that for me? Have been quite small. I think the peppers, the fruit. I never get big ones. They do have a dark green collar, though. You have any thoughts on why that might be? Mm. You, you might just, it could be a fertilizer issue. It might want to try a different uh, variety of, uh, I guess she's probably talking about bell peppers, so. Yeah. It might, it might be a uh, fer fertilizer issue. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, that would be one, um, maybe send in a, a picture or contact your local educator and maybe um, either to go there and to take a tour of your little garden space or to get a picture of it to help troubleshoot um, that even further um, would be good. Um, so we have a kind of two questions all lumped together. Uh, I have an area of my garden that is very wet. How do you drain a garden? And then the next question is I have clay soil and I've added peat and I'm going to add sand this year, but then they also want more ideas for drainage. So two kind of questions on drainage there. Well, drainage, um, if you, if you want to use a drainage tile, I mean, you, you could do, do that and actually put in some uh, drainage tile that could be like, I don't know how big the garden is, but uh, three, three foot, uh, three and a half foot deep, uh, and then s space that at, you know, 35, 40 foot, if, if your, you know, garden is, uh, is, that, is that big. And uh, the problem with that is, you, need, you kind of need an outlet. So if you don't have a, a good outlet that is close by, then you might be running a ditch tile a long way to a, to a ditch. And then what was the second question about? Um, they're just trying to add amendments to their soil because it's a clay and they want to increase drainage. Yeah, mixing in some uh, some sand with, with that clay, that that would uh, that would in, increase the uh, increase the drainage. Um, then Patty from the um, Terre Haute ISU Community Garden, she said that they found that baby powder helps them control some beetles. It seems like so that's a good good tip for something. Um, try out. Hi Patty. <laughs> um, okay the next question is would hardwood mulch be a good ground cover? Yeah you could you could use hardwood mulch. Um, Just make sure it's not walnut. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Lisa, I'm not sure. Can you expand on your question? What about tilling versus non-tilling? Um, not sure exactly like what can you give us more on what you might want to know? Um, Linda, you'll get a copy of the recording for the presentation and the publications, but we haven't been posting copies of just the PowerPoints, but you will be able to see and capture that information from the recording. Okay, yeah. Um, then someone else mentioned that if there's a sudden rain, the tomato can take in the water too quickly and that um, may cause the cracking that we were talking about earlier. That was kind of my guess too, but without seeing a picture and knowing for sure um, exactly what it looks like, um, just kind of speculation. Yeah. Um, and yes, yeah, Stuart said the peppers themselves were small, not the plants. Stuart, have you left them longer to see if they get any bigger if you wait? Um, like, are you picking them? Um, I had a one person I worked with, she said, um, wait until the peppers are pretty firm and you they have the deep lobes is that's when you pick them. So just make sure you're giving them that plenty of time to mature maybe. Um, may have been planted late. Okay. Okay, Phil. So the, I think one of the last questions, the tilling question, I know people who have stopped tilling. So is there a benefit to not tilling for the garden? Oh yeah. Yeah. I think you get better, um, microbial activity as far as spent well, the earthworm, um, likes the uh, the no-till better and we're we're trying all the time to get corn and bean producers to uh, to no-till for for healthy soils so you know i'm i'm definitely an advocate of a uh, of no-till if if you can do that in your garden and still have healthy plants then i'm i'm all for that Okay. I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you everyone. We're just a couple minutes past one. Um, we'll stick around a few more minutes. If you have any questions, um, we will answer those. If not, we hope you have a great rest of your day and we will see you all next week.